again, good evening to everyone who's here tonight and good evening to everyone who's watching us virtually. Thank you for being part of this discussion today, a very important discussion. Rosa Luxemburg Stifting, um, Rosa Luxemburg Stifting invited me to be the moderator today and I was quite interested in their topic and I jumped at the opportunity to be part of this information sharing session. Today we'll be talking about the limits of volunteerism in human rights due diligence framework. I think a lot of people think this is seriously complex stuff we'll be talking about. But today's panel will be breaking this down for us and explaining to us what companies across the world should be doing and what kind of frameworks they should be working within to ensure that they consistently are protecting the human rights of the communities that they are working within. And there's so many examples in the South African context of companies coming to a country, coming to different African countries, doing what they do, getting the proceeds and leaving. And many of those communities are left with so little. And I want you to keep this in mind as our panel talks about the more complex uh, parts of this discussion. Keep this in mind. Keep those companies and entities in mind that you know of that have not followed through with their due diligence and have not followed through with the plans that they're supposed to have fulfilled in South Africa or in any other country that you can think of. With that in mind, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers today. We'll start off with Johan Lor Loren Lorenzen, I'm so sorry about that, Johan. Um, he is an, a practicing attorney at Richard Spohr in Attorneys, and he has worked on the Shell Seismic Program case, and he's going to be talking to us about some of those due diligence that Shell should have done before attempting to come into South Africa and, and, on, and try to work on the Wild Coast. Usiko Lutango will also be um, part of the panel today, and she is a researcher at Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and she has done quite a lot of work around the guiding principles of business and human rights, uh, the UNGPs. She'll be explaining how those internationally can be connected to some of the work that is being done in South Africa. And then we've got Dr. Melanie Muller, and she is a senior associate with a with a specific focus on the South African or Southern African at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. She is the head of the research project called Approaches for Transnational Governance of Sustainable Commodity Supply Chains. She's done a lot of work around the international framework and what, where Germany currently is now, the framework that they're trying to build, and where the EU is as well. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Johan. Thank you. So this place that it plays means that for one man for all the time. Thanks, Ajahn Duwe, and uh, thanks to the to everyone who's come to the panel. And I have a both with the, the moderator and my fellow panelists a much more qualified uh, group than, than I am. So I'll just do my best to get in, get out, and paint a picture for the, 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 theory, the theories to flow. Um, and, and in this context, we are a small private law firm that works with communities that resist uh, multinational extraction uh, from land and, and now uh, from sea. And in the context of voluntarism and, and uh, the work around international covenants and, and law, um, it's, it's an interesting discussion for us. Um, the UN guiding principles that we, that are dealt with by this panel frame uh, the context of consultation as a meaningful consultation with potentially affected groups. So it's meaningful in, in some sense of having some impact on, uh, on, on the actual program design. And then what's imp the potentially affected groups, I think, is also important that it's not just a certainty that there's a direct impact. There's a potential uh, 
uh, potential effect. That's where this comes in. The, the guiding document then spells out um, where, even where that type of consultation is not possible. Business enterprises should consider reasonable alternatives such as consulting credible and independent expert resources, including human rights defenders and others from civil society. And so in that context, we then turn to the Shell case study that uh, will be delved into in more detail by my fellow panelists, but if I can just then paint a picture. We have a context where Shell, a multinational, wanted to explore for oil and gas resources off of South Africa's uh, shores. And in so doing, they consulted with business industries, with the the, or they actually purchased an exploration right uh, from, uh, that was a product of consultation with industries, with the major fishing industries. Um, but what they seem to not have done, despite committing on their website and uh, publicly and internationally, is to have consulted with uh, those who might who might be meaningfully affected, and specifically with directly affected customary indigenous communities who are fishing. And um, this, many people would be familiar with this from the, if you were following the news in December of 2021, it, uh, a notice came up in November 2021 that picked up and grabbed into the news and all of a sudden on TV and around social media, there was then protests across the country of people saying no to Shell. But in that end, that then gathered into groupings with uh, some affected uh, from the fishing industry as well as international environmental NGOs who tried to then stand up to stop that from happening, but were unsuccessful in doing so. There was an urgent uh, court interdict that was turned away by the, Graham, by the Makanda High Court. Um, and in that context, as that uh, failure unfolded, the failure to stop that despite a national uproar and uprising against uh, seismic blasting and against oil and gas exploration, which of course leads to um, oil and gas production, which leads to climate change, as we know, um, there was significant uproar and protest, but the courts did not come to the aid of those protesters, um, of liberal civil society, or of the international NGOs that, that did their best to step into the gap. And so into the breach came uh, communities along the wild coast. And the, it's important to then remember what they were standing up against. They were standing up against what our advocate Dembeke and Klukai Tobi referred to as a warship. The Amazon warrior was brought dragging air guns behind it between every five and 10 meters, blasting every 15 seconds for up to six months at 220 decibels. Um, blasting from between 3 and 25 meters below the surface. And as evidence came out, while in 2013 when the right was granted, it was suggested that for zooplankton, the very basis of the food chain, that within 10 meters there may be some die-off. Later uh, evidence from 2015, 2017 scientific studies suggested that, that goes between 1 and 1.5 kilometers. So for over six months, every 15 seconds, one to 1.5 kilometers, there'll be blasting and death at the very basis of the food chain. And that blasting, while it was downplayed, can be heard from often, you know, on a regular basis, over 400 kilometers, and on occasion from over 4,000 kilometers away, the blast could be heard uh, through the sea. So in this context, then communities stepped up where um, international NGOs and South African civil society, despite widespread protests, despite significant pressure on government, 
uh, these communities stepped up and which communities stepped up. The first and the community that we have represented as a law firm for a long time is the Polobini community, which uh, lives along the wild coast and uh, defended their land not only in this context, but in the context of uh, colonialism and apartheid to establish there's a reason why some of the most pristine land, where, whereas colonialism and apartheid, for the most part, swept black people off of their land uh, in a systemic way. This community defended their land, um, and they did so through, through um, resisting forced removals, and, through, and they built it up, not out of nothing, but through an interconnection with uh, generations from the past, from drawing on the ancestors, to saying if our ancestors have def de defended this land and our connection with the sea, then we must do the same for future generations. Um, and so they defended their access to stunningly beautiful land and sea on the wild coast of South Africa. And uh, as I said in this litigation, over generations we have conserved them, our land and our sea, and they have conserved us. So establishing this intertwined relationship um, in Isiem Pondo, as put by Siabonga and Dovela, Ngumuntu, Ngabantu, uh, Umtu, Ngumuntu, Ngabantu, Nagamvelo. A person is a person because of other people and because of nature building on this um, ethic. And it was not only the Kolobini community that stepped up, it was also the Duesa Kwebe community, which had been forcibly removed. They themselves had been forcibly removed from their land and through the 1990s and 2000s had fought physically and in court to establish their rights over access to their ancestral seas with the same ethic of conservation. We protect the sea and in return the sea protects and sustains us. And uh, so the principal line of attack, I mentioned uh, UN guiding principles, provisions around meaningful consultation. The principal line of attack was that there had been no consultation, not only no meaningful consultation, no consultation whatsoever with these communities who would be affected and who sustain themselves from the very sea that these seismic blasts uh, would be would be blasting. Um, and so moving then uh, swiftly on to that term blasting, with, which the companies complained bitterly about. They complained that the community said we, our seas are being blasted. But their own documents reveal that using the term blasting was colloquial within industry. And of course, what else would you get from an air gun? No, it's not an explosion um, with gunpowder. But air guns at 220 decibels every 15 seconds, an explosive impact that totally affects the soundscape that is beneath the sea. And this wasn't, this was then asserted that communities were concerned about a, f a few things. But the, the first and foremost was that communities, the most powerful ancestors of these communities uh, reside in the sea. And so communities then approach the sea both for their, their customary rituals to draw strength, um, as well as through uh, various uh, Christian traditions to go into the sea and where the soundscape and the effect of the blasting would be significantly felt. Um, but also then the impact on the marine environment that sustains uh, communities in terms of a livelihood uh, perspective. And as, as I mentioned at the outset, the original science relied on by in the environmental management pr uh, program was that a blast only affects zooplankton, the, the basis of this food chain, at 10 meters. But then... Uh, Shortly thereafter, and, and that, that was linked to industry, but then shortly thereafter, with a kilometer, 1.5 kilometers 
distance, that was actually the impact that was shown to be had by these blasts. And that, if you lose your zooplankton, the foundation, that has a significant impact on your ability to harvest fish, as well as um, the, of course, the impact that cascades down the entire food chain. And so, wow, the, these communities were cr criticized as being apartheid supporters, neo-colonialists, for standing in the way of development with no basis. Some of the world's leading experts came out to stand uh, in solidarity with them and say that their concerns are not baseless. Uh, Dr. Dav, uh, Doug, uh, Professor Doug Novacek from Duke University, uh, Professor Aaron Rice from Cornell University, who said, in my expert opinion, based on best available science, proposed surveys have a high likelihood of both acute and chronic impact to marine life in the proposed region surrounding the Transkei and Algoa survey areas. And so through this, communities rose up to stop this seismic blasting. And uh, shortly thereafter, they were supported by West Coast communities who uh, were descended from Kuei and Sun communities as well as uh, slave, slave descend descendant communities along the coast who were also fishing to stop seismic serving surveys along the entire coast and uh, in, in alignment with South Africa's leading uh, marine scientists who said, until we have a full assessment of what the impact of, is of these air guns, we need to have a complete uh, cessation. And through that, both sets of communities, the Wild Coast communities in the Shell litigation as well as the West Coast communities in the Search of litigation, were able to get temporary interdicts, um, interim interdicts or temporary injunctions from further blasting. And now we're back in court at the end of the month for final interdicts to stop uh, the blasting from proceeding. And um, I think this forum is very powerful. I won't go into too much detail uh, because I've, I'm with an esteemed panel. But this forum is an opportunity to reflect on the uh, possibilities of on, on what, what the opportunities are from voluntary uh, human rights guidelines. And I do want to start by saying I think we shouldn't write them off. I think there is, we shouldn't say that a companies committing to human rights guidelines are worth nothing. That is itself, it, it can have some value, and, and we should have some faith that uh, companies can do, can do better than what they're doing, um, because of course they can. Uh, but also, I think we need to reflect on the impact of making these standards voluntary. When you establish a standard that companies can choose to abide by without enforcing it, you set a risk for the companies that, that actually decide to abide by these standards because the companies that don't then have the opportunity of a race to the bottom to be more profitable by cutting corners because there are no consequences if they don't uh, comply. And so in not setting uh, binding standards, you set a penalty for the companies that actually strive to do the right thing because, uh, you, you don't, um, because there are no consequences for the companies that choose not to. Um, I think we also should then reflect on where we do have binding protocols and where we don't. If you were to be attempting to do this type of uh, survey off, off European coasts, there would be no question of whether it's voluntary or not to follow certain standards. The, it, of course, would be established through law because you need to have teeth for these, if, if it's worth having, if it's worth having these standards, it's worth enforcing. And so in establishing voluntary standards, I think we should also reflect on who, uh, who is protected by voluntarism and who is protected by binding and mandatory protocols that have teeth. Um, and uh, I think I'm looking forward to the contributions from my fellow panelists, but 
I think the, the last standard, and, and this is perhaps limited uh, because I come from a particular paradigm, but the idea as a lawyer that you have voluntary standards just feels like such a disjuncture. If you're going to have a standard, give us a standard that, that has consequences. So those are my brief reflections on the shell, on the shell litigation, the shell judgment that we've had, and the, the shell judgment that we hope to establish coming forward, and I look forward to hearing um, from, from my fellow panelists. Thank you so much, Johan. A lot of what he said for me resonated around the communities and whether the communities are alone in fighting the acute impacts on the land and on the human rights as well. It makes sense why companies um, won't consult communities because of course of profit. But when governments themselves turn around on their own people, especially with the context, uh, Johan, that you brought in of the apartheid um, era, when governments won't even enforce their own laws, because there are laws already in the country, and government won't even enforce their own laws to protect their people, it becomes a much trickier conversation to be had. But we will definitely be having questions, and I've got a couple for you, Johan, already, on some of the points that you made. But for now, I'm going to welcome Usiko Lutango. Please do forgive me, Usiko. She is the program director of Rosa Luxemburg Stifting. And she will be talking to us a bit about combining South African communities. How, do, how are we meant to combine the South African communities and across the world, I guess, um, with the guiding principles and the human rights due diligence that companies like Shell and many others that are in Cape Town this week should be following. How do we ensure that that happens? Siko? Thank you, Archie. Um, so much pressure from Johan. I hope I live up to his standards. Um, can I just have some assistance with the mic for the shorter people? <laughs> Okay, that works a bit. Good evening, everyone. Um, so my presentation will basically be focusing on why Shell and its seismic survey program. Okay, the mic is, I think it's collapsing a bit. <laughs> much better, thank you so much. So um, my presentation is titled Beyond Voluntarism, the Shell Seismic Program in the Wild Coast, because I think uh, we're at a moment where we should be reflecting about why it's important to move beyond voluntarism in human rights due diligence frameworks. So perhaps we can start with some definitions. So the term institutionalized voluntarism um, is one that best captures uh, the current period in question of the United Nations Guiding Principle, also known as the UNGPs. Uh, what it basically um, entails is that it is a compromise uh, between greater procedural commitments by business to prevent human rights violations, but at the same time, it falls short of full international legal liability. And of course, this presents both opportunities and challenges. The opportunity, for example, is within reinforcing human rights legal obligations at the national level by, for example, implementing legislation and policy um, that m mandates human rights due diligence. However, the challenge is that due to the limitations of voluntarism, there is, of course, a lack of compliance from cooperation in the absence of these binding international legal ob obligations. And in a global order that normalizes exploitative supply chains, economic inequality and corporate capture, I think it does call for greater co a regulation in the form of binding international human rights regulations. So what are they, the United Nations guiding principles? They are first of all the most internationally recognized business in human rights framework, which was adopted by the Human Rights Council in 2008. And their aim is to influence decision-making of corporates 
and they also try to establish certain duties and obligations on states to protect human rights. When implementing these UNGPs, corporates are at least expected at the very minimum to conduct a human rights risk assessment in the form of a due diligence to avoid human rights violations and to mitigate and to remedy those that do arise. And this is also along the state duty to protect against third party human rights violations, including through preventative measures, adjudicative measures and punitive measures as part of, these, of their obligations in the international framework to protect against human rights violations. They are operationalized by a framework called the Res Protect, Respect and Remedy Framework, which is represented by three pillars. The state duty to protect against human rights violations by businesses and enterprises. The corporate responsibility to respect, emphasis being on respect human rights, which is pillar two. And the third pillar, which is greater access by victims to effective remedy, which is a pillar that should not be forgotten. As it relates to human rights violations, however, businesses, the UNGPs do not impose legally binding uh, duties, as Johanna has already mentioned. Um, their, only duty, their only requirement is to respect. And what this basically means is that it's a societal expectation for companies to do no harm, not just by refraining from action, but also to take positive steps to ensure that their operations do not infringe on the human rights of others. However, they are also not necessarily law-free because they can be operationalized through the enactment of national laws, which can be, for example, through the uptake of national action plans, which are called NAPs, which states can adopt as they are duty to protect. Although, even though they are law-free, this is not expressly uh, communicated in Pillar 1. And what basically this means is that it's merely a, a conduct, a standard of conduct. So therefore, a standard of conduct on states is then, you can say, outsourced as a double layer of standard to businesses. So therefore, while they are relevant in an attempt to create a more meaningful observance of human rights, they are rooted in voluntarism. And this means that they are a softer regulatory approach that is not rooted in an authoritative source. And the implication is that there is incoherence across the globe in the way the, the adoption and implementation of human rights um, obligations are done. So let's talk about Shell then, at the global human rights policy, and they are global human rights. They are one of the companies that have adopted the UNGPs, and they report that their internal management and oversight um, has been done to align with the UNGPs. Particularly, like companies, uptake has been in due diligence requirements and expanding the role of non-judicial grievance mechanisms for example, at the operational or site level. Shell requires major projects and facilities to develop a social performance plan that defines the actions of managing the possible uh, positive and negative impacts on communities. And this is in their annual report. As part of their social plan, the company is required to identify, to understand the social environment and the stakeholders who may be potentially vulnerable to possible human rights violations, in addition to develop community feedback mechanisms to engage with stakeholders about any queries or complaints that may arise and with the, with the, with the aim of trying to solve them in a timely manner. Furthermore, the social performance plan re requires them to avoid, to minimize, and to mitigate potential impacts on traditional lifestyles and cultural heritage of indigenous people, including the avoidance of involuntary resettlement. So then what happened in the Wild Coast with such a great global human rights policy framework? <laughs> um, the interdict granted by the Makanda High Court to carry out the three-dimensional seismic survey for oil and gas is an example basically of how human rights due diligence can become a meaningful, meaningless, sorry, tick box exercise in the context of voluntarism. In granting the, the interdict, the Makanda High Court ruled that the CERVIC survey and blasting had the potential to cause, to cause significant lasting damage to marine life, the livelihoods of fishing communities, and to potentially infringe on the customary and constitutional rights of surrounding com communities, as alluded to by Johan. 
in our constitution, section 24, the right to environment is, is, uh, is a right. And, and it is associated with the right to food, water, health, and dignity. Additionally, there are subsistence farmers, they are holiday makers, adventurers, who are deeply connected to the wild coast. And more importantly, especially in the context of the theme of the mining in Daba, alternative mining in Daba, to help ecologically sustain the wild coast. For example, in future, a future oil spill that can spread hundreds of kilometers should be a serious consideration. And with Shell having a reputation through the, for example, cases like the Okpapi, the recent one, where Shell was taken to a Dutch court in January 2021 and was found liable for damages in the form of compensation and environmental rehabilitation in the Niger Delta, threatening the food security and food rights of the local community, it should not be lost to us that the Wild Coast could find itself in the same fate. What all spills do is they risk the contamination of water systems such as rivers, and they inadvertently also compromise the health of surrounding communities, further compromising their human rights to access to clean water. And according to Judge Gerald Bloom, Shell's stakeholders' analysis was clearly substantially flawed because it did not consider the subsistence and the small-scale farmers along the coastline where the blasting would be carried out, though it plainly had a duty to do so. In the Wild Coast, for example, where extraction lime mining has been vehemently opposed by surrounding communities and uh, community activi activity, activ activist groups like the Amadiba Crisis Community com Committees who have been involved in a battle against the Australian mining company in favor of an ecological economic model. In the context like this, consultation, due diligence, and community feedback should be really be deemed important, and this is what they missed. Therefore, this means that their due diligence or stakeholder analysis was actually not even context-specific or localized. And for example, the way in which the notification procedure was carried out for, for the call for consultation, it was an advertisement in a newspaper, and it was in English and Afrikaans only, in an area that mostly speaks Istanbul and Isikos. Therefore, the consultation from the very beginning, the call even, was inaccessible and even less empowering. And this goes against Shell's community feedback mechanism, which relies on a, a criteria borrowed from the UNGPs. So the way in which the community engagement and feedback ma was managed was also not done in a way that was effective, because it's not clear whether a grievance mechanism was established by Shell to actually deal with the pushback before heading to the litigation process. This is not very democratic. Courts should be a measure of last resort. So we can then conclude that the process was fundamentally flawed in the way it invo informed, involved, and consulted, collaborated, and empowered potentially affected groups like the fishermen. From the beginning, the due diligence process did not promote public access, nor transparency, for example, to effectively and meaningfully engage the community about the impacts of the seismic survey on livelihoods, cultural identity, and environmental impacts, and for future purposes, if there, there is oil extraction. The importance of doing so is something that's also acknowledged in the Mineral Councils of South Africa within the human rights policy framework. Shell, for example, only consulted traditional leaders and disregarded all other potentially affected groups like the fishing communities. And this, of course, reinforces Judge Bloom's conclusion about the stakeholder mapping being substantially flawed. And as part of due diligence, a stakeholder analysis at the minimum is a very integral part of of, of, a, of, of any operation in a community like the Wild Coast, and in this case, it was clearly undermined. Others may interpret the resistance uh, that companies receive from communities as being anti-developmental. In reality, it is a reflection of flawed consultation processes and a dearth of non-judicial mechanisms that leave communities with no choice but to opt for litigation. The, therefore, the Shell case is a, a, a good example of how the efficacy of the UNGPs in achieving its desired outcomes in practice has been limited, especially as it relates to human rights due diligence. 
and therefore leads one to conclude that despite the promulgation of parent company human rights policies and the endorsement of the UNGPs, voluntarism has limitations because it is essentially self-regulation. This is mainly because human rights due diligence as a process is rooted in transnational social norms and not in international legal norms. And they were envisaged to be supra-legal norms that were supposed to coexist with other legal norms. This is especially problematic in weak governance zones, especially in the global south, where institutions tend to favor politicians, traditional leaders, military officials, and cronies. As in the Shell case, for example, as I've mentioned, the consultation was only done with traditional leaders. And in situations where states are complicit with business, it becomes very difficult to, to blur the lines, to not blur the lines. Furthermore, in, expo in opposing the interdict, Shell argued that it obtained the necessary regulatory approval. And therefore, the case also highlights a governance gap. The environmental management program that was approved by the Minister of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, um, when, if, when Section 9 of the Mineral and Resources Act is invoked, it excluded Shell from obtaining a National Environmental Management Act approval since it was granted prior to 2008. And this was before the environmental authorization requirements were introduced. The implications, therefore, is that Shell voluntarily electing to publish a global human rights policy and commit to it, but to not meaningfully conduct a human rights due diligence in seeking the seismic program, highlights, which is very important, that where governance gaps persist, combined with gaps in the international regulatory human rights framework, it leads to non-compliance. Thus, it is important to move beyond voluntarism in human rights due diligence frameworks. And the United Nations binding treaty on business and human rights can complement the UNGPs in addressing the international human rights regulatory gaps. Although this, is, this type of complement, complementarity is contested, um, as argued by Deva, for example, a basic complementarity with the UNGPs should at the very least include a mandatory human rights due diligence and at least a minimum basket of human rights that should be, that companies should be obliged to, to adhere to. But why we can also be, a, we can also have an ambitious complementarity to the binding treaty on business and human rights. And this one could even address environmental rights and climate change. In addition, an ambitious uh, complementary of the complementarity of the UNGPs and the binding treaty can operationalize in detail the human rights uh, due diligence framework to ensure that it does not become a tick box exercise for corporations by involving other stakeholders such as trade unions adopting a more gender responsive human rights due diligence and even considering the inclusion of a free prior and informed consent for indigenous group groups where applicable bearing in mind that the applicability of the free prior and informed consent is also contested. Nonetheless, multiple strategies can be used to create a human rights regulatory ecosystem, an ecosystem that can ensure that the means such as the UNGPs do not become the ends. And this is by including national legal liability, the UNGPs, and the binding treaty on business and human rights. My recommendations, and to conclude, the uptake of the UNGP national action plans by African states remains relevant and necessary. This is to identify existing governance gaps, such as the provision of grievance mechanisms and multi-stakeholder initiatives at the local level to create impartiality-enhancing institutions and to identify existing legislative gaps that lead to non-compliance, at least domestically and nationally. For example, the insolvency laws and the mine closure legislative frameworks are one such example, where companies are increasingly in South Africa avoiding the rehabilitation of mines.
doing so can also feed into the treaty process where our governments can actually negotiate with some more strength. Avoiding the national action plans or adopting the national action plans will not hinder the current United Nations intergovernmental working group's work to elaborate on an international binding instrument to regulate in international law the activities of transnational corporations and other business. In fact, it will support it. South Africa thus should remain committed to the binding treaty on business and human rights negotiations at the Human Rights Council. Because the UNGPs, again, are just a starting point. They're not the end point. And the UNGPs, um, should, which existing in a structure of um, irresponsibility and inequality, are getting, uh, more and more becoming more tested uh, in terms of just how much teeth they have. The lack of compliance, on the other hand, from companies and the meaningfulness in which business implements their human rights policies necessitates moving beyond international voluntarism from soft to hard law, in which states should commit to passing legislation that provides preemptive measures and creates liability for businesses in the scope that will be agreed upon in a treaty and within the opportunities provided for by the UNGPs. Giving an, an instrument some real teeth means determining at least, for example, what, what kind of um, uh, 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 breach, breaches are in, in, the human rights, in the human rights regulated framework. In addition, it also, in terms of disclosure, disclosing human rights information should not be an option for companies. And finally, in obtaining accountability, it should be obtained throughout the lifestyle of operations and it should be reported on and oversight should be, man should be maintained by government. And thank you very much. Normalizing exploitative supply chains. I think that is what kind of stuck with me, Siko. Just that, yeah. And I actually was trying to imagine if companies actually respected communities, actually really respected communities, there'd be so much that we wouldn't, we wouldn't need from all of this legislative and, and legislation and laws. And we could, as communities, all of us, achieve so much more. But, as we know, that is not the reality. So how do we forge a way ahead? Because voluntarism doesn't work with these different entities. So we have Dr. Melanie Mullum, who's going to be talking to us a bit about how some European companies, sorry, some European countries are starting to forge a way ahead and thinking about how to get these companies on board outside of them volunteering to do the right thing. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. I just changed the presentation because I also brought one. Um, yeah, are we here we are. You can see it right now, okay. Yes, first of all, um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to um, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and also to the Mail and Guardian for uh, inviting us or inviting me to this panel discussion. Um, I'm, I'm the head of a research project in Germany that looks at um, transnational supply chains. So we really look at also at how German companies buy from companies in other countries, other regions. Um, and we investigate um, specifically the supply chains of metals, um, platinum from Southern Africa into Europe, um, also gold from Southern Africa into Europe. Uh, we look at copper um, from Latin America into Europe and really look at the different steps in the supply chains, not only extraction, but also the role of companies, the role of um, trade um, and investigate how um, governance could enforce um, stronger um, human rights standards and also sustainable standards uh, in these supply chains. 
Um, what we also do is to look at um, the due diligence legislation in Europe and in Germany, which is new um, and hopefully an attempt to denormalize uh, exploitative uh, supply chains. Um, and um, because um, that also acknowledges that companies in the EU share a responsibility for human rights violations when they buy um, from other regions. Um, and it speaks a bit to what Siko mentioned um, um, within the UNGP framework, Pillar 2, uh, that, I mean, maybe 15 years ago, um, I think the common understanding was that states are responsible uh, to prevent human rights violations. But I think the new, these frameworks um, also have an understanding that companies in like gray areas, in tra which transnational supply chains are, right? Um, um, they also um, have a co-responsibility and uh, cannot just get away with there is no legislation. And I think that is a very important understanding that, that we have today. Let me just um, uh, tell you what is happening in the European Union at the moment. Uh, so what we've seen in the past years is that there are various uh, European member states that adopted binding um, due diligence laws. Um, and I think um, over the past 10 years, there's an increasing debate on due diligence. And um, I mean, Siko mentioned the United Nations uh, guiding principles uh, that um, entered into force in 2010 with a more voluntary approach. Many European countries adopted the national action plans uh, with voluntary commitments. Um, that means that German and European importers, and I mean, there, I think there is a difference between um, many European companies. Um, um, we don't extract that much minerals and metals, for example, in, in, in Europe anymore, and then import is quite crucial. But German and European uh, importers um, and those voluntary commitments also share responsibility when they import from other countries and um, have to look at um, their uh, the due diligence when they, when they buy from other companies. At the same time, I think what became quite clear is that those national action plans were not sufficient. Um, and it's interesting um, to know that Germany, for example, the previous government um, um, adopted a national action plan on a voluntary base and they said we give our companies a few years time and see if they implement their due diligence properly. But then realized, <laughs> Uh, surprise, yeah, it didn't really happen and now we have a, a more, or last year the, uh, the parliament adopted a more binding law that will enter uh, into force at the beginning of 2023. But you can also see that, for example, in France, in the Netherlands, also in Norway, there are due diligence laws that um, have been adopted already. There are other member states working on um, binding um, binding commitments, binding laws, um, um, and then, and I think that is the most um, interesting discussion at the moment, the European Commission uh, proposed a directive on corporate sustainability due diligence on a European level, um, which goes even further than some of the national laws and could like um, have or create a level playing field because, well, I mean, this is, quite fascinating to, to, to investigate. Um, all of these countries have different due diligence procedures and also the, the laws that um, France, for, the, the law that France uh, adopted is different to the German law. So I mean, on a long-term base, the question is, could the European Union create a level playing field for, for different companies? Um, when we discussed it, this, I think someone asked me, um, why now? I mean, why would they adopt it now? And I think First of all, um, in the past years, there's been, we've seen many transnational campaigns and incredible work of uh, international and also transnationally working NGOs on you know, problems or human rights violations in different business operations. I mean, Marikana is a very important example um, because um, BASF, which is a German company, um, imported uh, platinum from Lonmin, uh, which imported from Marikana, from the Marikana mine. And so the question was, is there a co-responsibility of BASF? And um, I think some of you might have seen that amazing um, campaign between South African NGOs and also European NGOs, German NGOs, um, bringing South African organizations to Germany in front of the BASF um, uh, uh, gate, so to say, protesting 
um, and uh, that was really fascinating. At the same time, I think um, there are other arguments um, because um, in some German companies even see sustainable supply chains and due diligence also as an element of strategic security of supply and resilience um, because very often human rights violations lead to delay um, of processes. They might even stop business operations. So the question is if it's done, let's say, properly and um, you try to mitigate human rights, um, from human rights violations from the very beginning, it could be more beneficial maybe yeah, to, to both, to importers and exporters. Also, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, published a very interesting report that also showed that companies who know their supply chains better and who know where they buy from um, were better able to, to you know, deal with the COVID-19 crisis because they knew where they would buy from. Um, so. Um, they knew the challenges, they knew how to deal with it, so that is also very interesting and um, might create an incentive for companies to um, reduce costs. It's not my, I'm not saying that, 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 you know, I think the human rights argument is a strong argument already. I'm just trying to explain that, you know, there is a shift in how businesses think about human rights, so it's not human rights and business, but a more integrated approach that also um, is, is, um, is maybe, I think, a shift in mindset. And then at the same time, from a consumer side, you also see a, an increasing demand for sustainable resources because consumers, um, you know, are much more aware of risks and they don't want to, like, um, contribute uh, to, uh, to uh, buying from sources that, are, that create human rights um, violations. Um, I think what we should discuss later is if there are also challenges for countries in the global south because if we see um, increasing like demand for implementation of human rights, what does what what does what what uh, what, what does that mean for countries that are not able to meet these demands just now, um, and could it create an incentive for divestment? Um, but I mean, maybe this is um, for our discussion later. Um, so, and um, I mean, one question is, is if the EU, if they implement uh, the law, um, could also become a pioneer in international standard setting. And there is a professor from Harvard who investigated the so-called Brussels effect, where some of the like norms um, that Brussels adopted trickled down to other regions and um, also had an impact um, on, on um, you know, legislations in other regions and in other countries. Um, I'll probably speak about the implementation of the laws a bit later. Just give you um, a quick example about the German law, which we um, uh, which we carefully looked at. Like I said, Parliament agreed last summer that um, uh, on, on this uh, law that will enter into force um, at the beginning of 2023. Um, and it means that German companies need to analyze human rights risks in their supply chains. They have to fulfill due diligence. They have to report their, on their obligations and establish complaint mechanisms. So it's basically what SECO told us already. But it also means that importers of goods from other countries need to do that as well with regard to their direct suppliers. So let me give you an example. If, let's say I'm a company buying making jewelry and I buy gold from South Africa and I buy gold from South African companies, I need to investigate my business partner and understand if uh, within, um, you know, the extraction of gold, for example, if um, um, human rights violations could happen um, and analyze them and analyze potential risks um, that, that might happen. So it's a basic example, but just that you, that, that you understand it's not only for companies within Germany, but also uh, when they import. Um, there is, not every company is affected, so um, after 2023, companies with more than 3,000 employees um, are obliged um, to fulfill these duties, and in 2024, it's companies with 1,000 employees. And the argument was bigger companies have more staff, they have more money, they are more, you know, capable of doing that. So in this first draft, or this, this first law, they excluded, like, smaller companies. 
Then, uh, like I said, it's direct suppliers. Indirect suppliers um, also need to be investigated when a company is informed about human rights violations. So that means, for example, um, if it's not my tier one supplier, my direct supplier, but there are others, and sometimes supply chains can be quite long, and I don't know, in South African organizations informs this German company that there are human rights violations happening in tier two or tier three, then the German company also needs to look at um, its business contracts and um, you know, uh, do something about it uh, and investigate it and also um, end uh, imports from, um, from, uh, from those supply chains. The scope, um, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, is, it affects certain human rights, the right to life, uh, the right to health, fair working condition, a decent standard of living, the right of association, the right of assembly, uh, and the prohibition, uh, prohib prohibit prohibition, sorry, it's such a difficult English word, um, of torture. Um, and then also environmental rights, um, especially the exposure to mercury and persistent organic pollutants, which is interesting, especially with regard to, to, to metals extraction. And then I think what is very interesting and important as well is that um, non-governmental organizations and trade unions in Germany are entitled to represent foreign victims of business-related abuses abuses in German courts. So um, that, is, that is an important element, I think. The problem is um, the parliament couldn't agree on civil liability, so um, um, enforcement means that fines, um, uh, companies can, can get fines, but there is no civil liability in debt uh, in, in, in this first uh, German law. Um, and there is a monitoring authority that um, is looking at um, the companies that are affected by it and on their business plans and uh, making sure that um, companies comply. Um, like I said, there is a European draft as well. Um, it's just a draft. It hasn't been agreed on. Uh, it's under discussion, um, um, aiming at creating a level playing field for uh, companies on the EU level that would go even further. Um, um, so, for example, there is even a stronger em emphasis on different um, environmental rights. Um, what is also interesting is that um, includes duties of the directors, so the management of companies can be made responsible if they don't like include human rights aspects um, into their frameworks. Um, and I mean, this is what our research shows, I think. We looked at different um, international mining companies and you can always see if the director is very like uh, forward looking and um, uh, trying to comply with human rights issues, it also shapes the company's agenda because of course it's, the strategy is made on top. So I think that is, um, that is an important aspect. Um, the, the European law does not only include tier one, um, but the entire supply chains and established business relations along the supply chains. It's not clear yet what that would mean because it would create certain loopholes if you say only established business um, um, uh, relations. Um, it includes civil liability compared to the German law, so there would be a strong emphasis on civil liability in, in the draft as it exists now. Um, and it includes also smaller companies than the German proposal, but it excludes um, small and medium enterprises specifically. Um, administrative supervision uh, will be done by the member states, but um, that is always a bit complicated because every time we have a European legislation, if the member states have to enforce it, it depends a bit on the ability of the member states to do that and also the willingness, of course. Um, and then there are two groups of companies with different um, duties. Um, and I'll just show you this now. I mean, it's very technical, so maybe we don't go into detail that much, but um, Group 1 is 9,400 EU companies with more than 500 employees and a net um, turnover of 150 million worldwide. Um, and it would also include non-European companies that operate in the European Union um, with um, a net um, a turnover of 150 million euro. So that is really interesting because it's European legislation that might affect um, other, other companies, like companies from, from other um, regions as well. And then a second group um, that, um, that has different duties. Maybe I'll 
is that too, should I, should I go through it? How much time do I have? Because hmm? three minutes, okay, then I won't. Uh, no, but I, maybe what I wanted to say is, like I said, there are like different duties for uh, the two groups, um, but I think what is interesting is that um, uh, for the larger companies, the business strategy has to be in alignment with the Paris Declaration and also with CO2 reduction. So there's a very strong emphasis on the climate change agenda as well, um, apart from the human rights aspect. Um, that um, that that um, will also um, shape uh, business strategies um, if uh, if the European Commission can agree to implement that. Um, I won't run you through this. It's a very long legislative process. I mean, like I said, in France it started in 2019 already. There's a German due diligence law, and now we're somewhere here where um, you have a very complicated European Union um, mechanism. Um, and um, I think I mentioned it before that I think the law and the Russian invasion might delay the process a bit because now many European companies are trying to decouple from, from Russia and not import from Russia anymore. So um, there's a lot going on at the moment and um, I, think, I think what will happen is that they, they, will, they will delay the European due diligence law process a bit. Um, um, because it's um, really difficult um, to find alternative sources at the moment. And now the argument is that if you would overburden companies with you know, these due diligence processes at the moment, it would be too much. I mean, it remains to be seen what is going to happen because it could also be used as a strategic um, tool, um, like putting pressure on other countries, but, but we'll see. Um, Maybe just, and this is my last slide, and it brings us back to, to South Africa and um, the transnational aspect. Um, I think, I mean, the, 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 the problem is, I mean, when we speak about um, the case, the shell case that we invested, we speak about like the extraction on a very local level. But on, in these transnational supply chains, you have so many actors that are involved and so many actors that could contribute to um, to either human rights violations or human rights compliance, um, that I think those laws actually could aim at creating more transparency, transparency because it's really difficult to understand who takes part in the supply chains, for example, which companies responsible for the transport, are workers in transport uh, paid um, you know, according to um, the wages that they, that they should earn. So there are many different aspects. We often talk about extraction, but we neglect the rest um, of, of or the, the other um, like um, steps of the supply chain and those laws because companies need to report on their due diligence procedures might be able to creating more transparency as well. I think one challenge is identification and knowledge transfer of human rights risks along the supply chain. Um, so what needs to happen I think is much stronger multi-stakeholder cooperation between actors in Germany and the EU and partner countries because um, it needs to, like someone needs to bring attention to possible human rights violations, right? And that, I think, I mean, I mentioned Marikana, the Marikana campaign at the beginning. I think that was quite a successful um, element, but in other, like, supply chains, we don't necessarily have that kind of collaboration. Um, I think it also needs the creation of transnational institutional networks and the identification of relevant institutions that monitor human rights um, violations. Um, and um, the question is how to deal with those human rights violations, bring it to court and make sure that uh, victims get the remedies they deserve. Um, Maybe I just leave it here um, because I think it, leaves, it gives us a lot of room for discussion because I think for me it's really the first time that I speak about this in, in South Africa because we couldn't really have that discussion and I think we could bring together the loose ends here and also discuss on what is needed um, in order to facilitate bilateral cooperation and understand, you know, or... or like transfer knowledge uh, along the supply chain. Um, thank you very much. Melanie, thank you so much. Thank you. It
kind of sounds a bit ridiculous for us to be weighing up humanity, human rights, weighing that up with profits. So as Melanie was going through her presentation, extremely detailed, gave me a bit of insight of what can be done out there. I was thinking that like due diligence, especially around human rights, shouldn't be the basis of, of, of business. It should be the basis of business. And it should not be seen as a burden, no matter how big your business is, no matter how small it is. Due diligence should be important, and that should be where businesses are, are coming up from. I am going to open it up to our audience and for some questions, because I think there's some technicalities we would want a bit more clarity around, um, and basically how to arm communities and, 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 and help communities ensure that they can stand up for their rights when such huge companies come about to... Yeah, such huge companies coming about. Uh, I'm going to open it up for any questions. I'm happy to kick it off. <laughs> the gentleman at the back there. Please do state your name and who you would think would be best to answer your question. Yeah. On Good our evening, panel. everybody. I'm David Ramahan from Rastemek in Marigan. Um, Lawrence was in the presentation. You've mentioned that um, consultation most of the time is being done with the chiefs, which is actually a problem because such is not only actually happening in the in the in the in the, in the wild coast or the side of Colombia. It's also happening in our areas where we are coming from in the villages. And we see the problem, the narrative that our government is having is that they, they think that the chiefs are the owners of the land. And chiefs are not the owners of the land. They are just the custodians. The land has been bought by the people. Because I remember actually from an historical point of view, uh, when actually uh, there was an opportunity for a piece of land to be bought, the very same chiefs will be going to communities and say contribute. So, but now the matter has been turned now to say now they are the, 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 the owners of the land because when title lists are being issued, they are being issued under the names of the chiefs. So that is a very serious problem that you are faced with in this particular country. But Dr. Gavin Capps has written a book that chiefs are not the, 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 the owners of the land, which now actually says that mining companies together with government cannot take a decision to get only with chiefs. They have to come to the grassroots level and actually engage uh, communities that are directly affected by mining that are also owners of the land. That is actually a clear point of departure. So what the people of Kolobeni did, or the people of, uh, along the wild coast did, I think it was within their rights to, 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 to refuse shell actually to actually do seismic uh, uh, survey or blasting in the oceans. They are within, actually, they are, they are right to do so. Now, uh, Dr. Miller, in your presentation, you see um, you are talking about what is happening in Europe, which is far different from what is happening <laughs> in Africa. It's a different situation. It's a different approach. In Africa, the government actually in Africa, all governments, let me put it like that, 90%, they don't adhere actually to the legislations that they've adopted in parliament. That's one problem. The second problem is that uh, there is a problem of uh, engagement. The issue of pr free, prior, and informed consent doesn't ring in their heads. That's another problem that we are faced with. And then uh, when there are supposed to be decisions that must be taken, the consultation process is between the actual government and the mining companies. Certain stakeholders are left out. Hence, we are always having a problem. And lastly, we are having actually the very same politicians that we have deployed in parliament, that we have voted for into power, that are also actually shareholders. In South Africa, when we talk about triple BE, 
shareholders in, in mining companies. You're talking about politicians. And those that are politically connected. So those particular people, they, they are pushing their own agenda. They are not pushing the agenda of the communities. When you say actually have voted into power to protect us, when they are in parliament, when in government, they don't protect the poorest of the poor. They protect themselves together with their families and their interest in business. And so they become capitalists. And we've heard a lot of these kinds of stories. <laughs> that's right. We've had a lot of, heard of a lot of these kind of stories, and I guess that's why the likes of the alternative in Dava are so important when they actually deal with a lot of these issues. I... From what you're saying, one of the questions for me that comes up for Usik or Johan, from trying to bring everything together that you've said, for, and to connect it as well with what um, Dr. Muller had said, is Shell and South Africa are already signatories or are part of the UNGP. Yet, this particular community of Polobeni, other communities as well, in the northwest on the Rustenburg uh, Platinum Belt, they still have to fight with companies to do the bare minimum that they have said they're going to do in those particular areas. Can you speak to us, um, Johan Osiko, about that, about how, even though South Africa is part of this UNGP um, uh, and, 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 and Shell as well, or just some of those companies that are on that platinum belt, how does this actually work? We're fighting for who goes first. <laughs> Throwing me in the fire. I think um, uh, David and Atandiwe, my, my message, uh, which speaks to my presentation as well, would be the importance of creating impartiality, enhancing institutions at the local level. And this is a way where communities can engage not only with... Um, with government, but also with uh, companies, and also in a way where you can create grievance mechanisms that avoid litigation, or at least uh, see lit litigation as a measure of last resort. Um, and because in the context of governance gaps, where, for example, there isn't clarity in legislation around consultation, although Yoyohan and I have already published something that that clarifies some of the issues around um, consultation. These governance gaps combined with the complicated supply chains in which companies have now structured themselves leads to an, a problem of access to remedy and uh, a problem of, of access where communities can engage with government and with uh, stakeholders. This means that at the local level, as I have also mentioned in my presentation, there is a dearth of, of non-judicial um, mechanisms and this is again why it's important for government to not see the UNGPs as a waste of time you know it's important because you need to identify the existing gaps within your own legislation so that you can make sure that communities are able to access platforms to engage okay um, thanks and Dr. David and uh, attend to you eh? Um, and I think uh, Atendiwe made this point of due diligence just being the basis of business and a fundamental principle. And I, I really do think that's, that's somewhere where we need to be communicating more clearly to business, but also to the state and to communities and, and civil society that uh, due diligence is... It's, it's a fundamental principle, but what is due diligence depends on what is the law and what standards we set that are binding. And so if we establish uh, consultation as due diligence, what is that consultation? Um, and uh, I think Dr. David then really unpacks that the legal standard we're establishing very clearly. It's, it's not open for debate at this stage whether a consultation deals with only consulting with royal families or with directly affected people. Of course it's with directly affected people. We've, we may be, in our practice, entrenched in a colonial model 
of working with kings and chiefs and saying they speak for black people. But in this democratic constitutional era, we, it, it should be plain and simple that it's who is directly affected that should be consulted because meaningful consultation doesn't mean someone up there. It means someone who is actually affected and actually impacted. And I think, uh, to get back to Atendiwe's point, the more that we can make that clear and establish that companies who go for rights, as it, we will establish at the end of May, but we certainly feel confident Shell did, uh, it purchased the rights, but the, the right was as a product of only consultation in these publications as SICO went through that uh, were in English and Afrikaans and then directly consulting with monarchs. And if you are only consulting with monarchs and not the people who will actually be directly affected, you do that at your own risk. And that is a failure of your own due diligence. And we can establish standards of due diligence and, and that's all well and good. But ultimately, as long as these principles are binding, your failure to do due diligence is, is to your own detriment and to your own loss of profit. And so I think that's, that's something that I'm keen to get into. And then um, Tate David then made a point of I'm straying away from the guidance from the chair um, about how things look different um, from Melanie's presentation than what we know in South Africa. But I also then think it's important to establish that there's only one global market. You know, there's not South Africa and Europe. There's one chain. And that's where I think we need to be looking for opportunities to say, if that looks different, how do we take advantage of that and put pressure on those companies to then put pressure on uh, our companies and particularly our state? Because we have this liberation government that then wants to be producing for these companies, these European countries. And it's falling short of even European standards. And even with the basic principles of consultation, instead of saying, okay, how do we consult better with those who are going to be directly affected by our projects, it accuses the communities who complain and say, hey, we're directly affected. Uh, we are going to lose our fishing rights. We are going to have disruptions from our ancestors. Instead of saying, what can we do better? to even just meet the basic standards established in Europe, it's then accusing these communities of being colonialists and apartheid supporters. And I think we need to think of the structural conditions that, of course, we should hold companies accountable, but ultimately, we don't vote for companies, we vote for a democratic state. And what can we be saying to this liberation movement that is falling short of standards set in Germany, much less the standards that they set for themselves. Let me just add one point. I mean, South Africa is the most important business partner of Germany in Af uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, not Northern Africa, but I mean Sub-Saharan Africa, if I may use that terminology. Um, so that means those companies who import from South Africa after 2023, like at least the bigger ones, they really have, I mean, they have to ask their direct business partners all these questions, you know, and they will have to answer. So I mean, um, while this is not direct enforcement of human rights on a national level, I think it will create a different, different business environment. And um, I mean, I've seen uh, in the past months, there have been a couple of like engagement with South African companies because they also need to understand what these new laws in Germany mean. Um, so, you know, a company, a German company cannot just import without looking at the overall environment. And of course, they will then probably, hopefully, it also depends on the willingness of German companies, have to ask questions. And they might have to read a bit more about um, their direct business partners. Um, so I think this might put additional pressure on South African companies. What is happening in South Africa, of course, is, is I mean, your job, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, but, but I think, you know, there, there's more happening on, on different ends of supply chains, and I hope, um, and that's why I'm a bit, yeah, a bit hopeful about all of this, that it might change business environment in general, that, you know, just a cheap 
profit is not the first thing a company looks at, but really looking at a more sustainable environment and a more sustainable approach. Definitely, Dr. Mola. We have more questions. We have 10 minutes left. Just the gentleman here, and then we will take the gentleman in blue. And um, did you have a question? And the lady with the mask, and then the gentleman in navy. Let's try and keep them as brief as we can. We do want people to have a break soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mohamed Uzbe from Lawyers for Human Rights. Now, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, thank you. I mean, th thank for you know, um, brilliant presentation. The, the only lament I want to make is for me the, the the fact that, beside you know, being referenced as victims, what is missing in your analysis is the role of the working class in you know um, our enforcement mechanisms. I mean, for me, for discussions about beyond voluntarism, um, that has to be at the centre of it because. There are two fundamental points, right? One is, capitalism doesn't know morality. It's a system of extraction, of surplus, for profit, and for accumulation. And there's no morality in that. It's not about you know, what ought to be done that is right and so on and so on. If they can more, make more of profit, they will do it. Regardless of implications to humans, to labor, communities to the environment. So that's a starting point. The second thing is that the state, not less this state, but I think states across the globe as well, in the final analysis, there are organizations of this interest, the corporate interest, because, you know, whether you like it or not, I mean, you know, South African state is not just, um, you know, an organization of the bourgeois corporate interest in general, particularly South African state, is fundamentally the, the, the organization of the mining capitalist interest. That's the reason that, um, you know, no matter, you know, like how much rhetoric you're going to hear from them about the laws and so on, who among them takes those particular laws very serious? Uh, they pass one law and do entirely another. Now, the, the reason that is very important is that we do not have, let's be clear about it, this very impartial arbiter in the state who is just concerned and preoccupied with human rights in the interest of ordinary working class people. Um, we cannot hope to appeal to the morality and the ethics of the big cooperative. They have no soul. Now, what we must be preoccupied with is how do we build the power and that can only mean the power of organization of the only force at the call phase of the struggle. That is interested that if you are to talk about environmental justice, it has to be justice for them first and foremost. And for us, the laws for human rights is about how do you build powers of these particular communities that are affected by mining? How do you build powers of workers that are brutalized by big cooperations and so on? And how do we mobilize our resources, mega as they are, but which can be very vital, absolutely vital in building the strength and the fighting capacity of the workers' movement of communities in making sure they push back. So that, that is the point that I wanted to make. And, and you know, just to illustrate maybe in conclusion, Chair, is that, you know, I mean, because we should be very careful, right? I mean, I know, you know, strategic litigation, and the question I must always ask ourselves, when you say we have victories, strategic victories, these are victories for who, right? And, and I'll give an example because very often we're obsessed with getting our names in law reports. And, and we, we don't ask ourselves, right, how does this really benefit communities in whose name we want to call them so on? You know, an example of how that could also be done differently. I mean, we had a, a mining charter case where there was no judgment. But for me, that was one of the most strategic legal victories that I've seen, where in the morning of the case, we mobilized. There was all communities. The case was between Chamber of Mines and, and government, but we mobilized communities that the, from the very morning of that case, it became clear that the case had now become about communities that even when 
government and, and chamber came to an agreement, the court had to make an important note that the case is withdrawn, but also the second line was saying mining communities are interested in legitimate mm. party in the formulation of mining policy. Ever since that time, mining communities had to be consulted. And I think that was very important victory, and that victory was about mobilization and building power where it mattered. Thank you. Thank you, Dada Mamedu. And a lot of what you're saying is essentially that communities have to start getting together. These victories have to be about how the prog what progress is happening within communities and how they are reacting when such things happen, when a shell comes along or any other of these huge mining companies comes along. And that is so important. Mike over there, and then we'll come to you, sir. Thanks. Um, Frederick, I'm supporting the Benchmarks Foundations. Foundation and Joburg. Originally, I'm from Germany, so for me, that's also quite interesting to have um, um, yes, the intercontinental discussion. I think we've heard it here, and I've seen it in the communities that Benchmarks works with. There's a tiredness of fighting for the same battle again and again and not making strides. How do we get the power? How can we make sure that there is, um, yeah, that there is change for communities? And with the oversight function not being fulfilled, by government. It's a real problem. Mm. And there's no movement. Even when there is an agreement reached with the company, we have agreements with Anglo-American from 2018. They are not adhered to. So even if you've gone through the process of fighting it, of reaching an agreement based on a grievance. So question to you, what is it that you would give or advise communities here to do? If it is the German case, should we do documentation? documentation of all human rights violations? What is it that communities can do beyond the sphere of what they've been fighting in for the past 20 years and not really seeing that there's change created? What would be your suggestion? Thank you. Panel, that's a very hard question, I think, for me, too. Um, just, ha just keep that question. I, I'm just thinking about it now. All the communities that are written about and interviewed and over, like, over a decade, yeah, gentlemen. Hi, uh, I'm also from Lawyers Human Rights. Uh, my name is Wayne. Uh, since we've already taken up so much time with Sveis' uh, speech, I will try to keep my questions short and pointed. Uh, it was actually going to be very similar uh, to the question from Benchmarks, but really around uh, when we talk about beyond volunteerism and about binding uh, treaties and uh, this push towards enforcement of regulation, uh, particularly in the context of uh, a capitalist state, we've, I think, uh, Johan, you mentioned, the, well, you probably didn't say his name, but I will, Guido Mantanche's comments, which were attacking villages and seemed to be very pro-mining, and we now have, I think uh, Dr. Muller mentioned, the Ukraine crisis and this push towards uh, uh, an energy uh, diversion from Russia, uh, there's clearly a push towards uh, ensuring that there is extractive uh, mining, uh, probably over human rights. How do we balance that and how do we factor that into our work and how do we ensure that, A, we push uh, uh, more regulation, more binding treaties on companies knowing that they have no interest and in fact they probably now have more incentive not to follow regulation and regulators also have that same incentive because of how they're positioned. Uh, sorry, it's a very open-ended question, but just- I like, I like the that. question, Wayne, because early on we kind of had a discussion similar to that around, yeah, I think we had a, a discussion similar to that. Let's just take the last question over there. Thank you, Chair. My name is Shane Trishana. I'm from Limpopo. Uh, I think my question goes to uh, Melanie. Uh, clarity and a short question. You mentioned that um, there is a conversation about not burdening companies uh, because of the war, more especially on the, on the due diligence uh, law. I'm, I'm a bit worried because really you can't postpone human rights and uh, where are those conversations coming from? And uh, yeah, a clarity actually on that one, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. because it's, it's worrying. More especially, I think, in the global south in countries like us, mm 
because even if a company comes from a, a, a country that adheres law, when it goes into a weaker uh, a country, they tend to follow what is happening in that particular country, for example, in countries like South Africa. So uh, the law is commendable, more especially when a country actually a volunteer to come up with a, a mechanism, because more especially in the global south, there is always a problem, I think, more especially, for example, in mining companies where they just can't uh, 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 do what they promise. So I, I, I'm kind of if you can give me a clarity on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Shane. I'm going to throw it to my panel. There's a lot of questions there. Uh, I'm not going to give you much time, my dear panel. Uh, but I let's start off with Frederica's um, question there. It's a, something that I'll have to actually think about as well. But I'm going to throw it to you, my panel. Hello. Um, it's this is the lady from the Benchmarks Foundation. I think I can try to answer her question and then I'll leave the rest of the questions to my fellow panelists. Um, if I had to give one advice to communities about what to do now is go straight to the parent companies and the parent countries and the home states rather. I think um, what the UNGPs have failed to do is to not clarify what we call extraterritorial obligations of states. And that is, as Melanie explained a bit, that you can, for example, what happened in the Niger Delta, where Shell, uh, the subsidiary of Shell, a case was taken all the way to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, they have uh, institutions that are better impartiality enhancing, you know, for various reasons, capacity, and the fact that the institutions, because of many reasons, have become more effective over the years. Um, take it to the home states and take it to the parent companies and litigate there where you can. And um, some countries, I think the Netherlands due diligence law promises to be quite promising, I mean to be quite progressive, because it, it not only has, it allows the courts to take um, cases that are not from there, but it also has non-judicial institutions where communities can actually lay complaints. That makes it much more less expensive for communities as well. And I hope that more um, uh, international legislation will allow such institutions, grievance mechanisms that are not judicial. So that would be um, my advice in the way communities can access remedy and enforce remedy because these complicated supply chains can be very difficult for our own institutions to handle even, even if we were willing, which sometimes we're not willing to try and enforce some of these remedies. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will, yeah, my, my idea goes in a very similar direction. I mean, if now um, companies um, have to implement grievance mechanisms, use that, um, because I mean, normally the state should be responsible for it, right? Uh, that's, I think that is really important to mention that, that it's the South African state that should be responsible for the implementation. And um, if that is not happening as it should, and I will never forget the day when I was in Pumalanga in the morning in a mining company and then met with, with the mining com uh, in the mining community and met with the mining company. And it was like there were two different worlds. There was a really difficult heartbreaking conditions the community was suffering from and then you went to the mining company who told you about the same area and it looked beautiful. So I think the question is how to bring that knowledge to importers in the European Union for example um, and so um, because and that is the, the other thing if German companies for example go to South Africa they don't necessarily go to communities right I mean they meet they might go to the city or the, the area that is affected, but they don't really get to see what is happening on the ground. So the question is how to bring the knowledge from A to B. And I think those um, grievance mechanism can be a tool, but also maybe working with like international NGOs that then also bring the knowledge uh, to their companies. And um, like I said, um, the German law also um, puts pressure on companies if they get to know about human rights violations in certain countries. So I think that could be used as a tool as well. 
Thanks for uh, these questions. Um, uh, Sabay, I always uh, appreciate and really appreciate how your question then uh, went in with Wayne's and uh, Federique's uh, of thinking about the working class and of communities and how they are quite literally in some contexts at the call face of this struggle and how there's no substitute for organization and mobilization amongst communities. Yes, communities are tired, but there is no substitute for this, for the type of work of resistance. When we think about, you know, we have uh, Nonkle and Baliwe here from Kolobeni. When we think about that struggle, the reason why Kolobeni is setting court precedence now is because uh, this community stood and has literally used their bodies to prevent mining from starting and prevent toll road from starting, which has then created the space. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Mm. That, that then creates the space for the law to then come in. But then I think we as a collective, particularly those of us who are privileged to be here, need to be thinking about how we then provide that solidarity for those communities, both, I think, the righteousness of that struggle on its own terms, but then the, the awareness that in fact, we're learning from these communities and we're learning from a planet that's burning, that there, there is only one planet and we are all affected uh, by, you know, if we are, there's no letting communities land be demolished uh, and, and we benefit from it and, and there's no consequences. At this stage, we're in a position where if, if we're not standing with communities who are defending land and defending the environment, then we are not, then our own, very own survival is also threatened. Not only us as South Africans who are, uh, us who are here and who are privileged uh, in South Africa, but also in, in Germany and across Europe and, and, and around the world. And so I think that's, that's a really important um, thing to take away and to then stand in solidarity with the communities who are organizing and mobilizing themselves and tired though they may be to try to give some support and, and give some uh, leverage both with our own mobilizing efforts and changing the law to make things a little bit easier and a little bit easier and a little bit easier for them, them to be less tired, but also mindful that, that we're fighting for, for one planet. Thanks. All right. I hope our panel has covered all the questions. If they haven't, please rush them when we're done here so that uh, we can all feel like we've taken something away from here today. Um, Johan, Melanie, Siko, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for being here today and having this conversation. And I thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. Before I quickly say good night, uh, I was asked that uh, can everybody who has been registered here for the conference please check their emails for information on the Sustainable Development Day. And if you do have an email about this, you have to be at the reception area at quarter past eight and bring your ID and vaccination certificate. Hope that helps. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight uh, here and uh, virtually. I'm Atandi Wesaba from The Mail and Guardian. Have a good evening. Plato said, Who will guard the guardians? Who are our guardians? Do they care about us? Are they accountable for their actions? Or are they above the law? Who elects these guardians? Us? Them? Someone else? And if they guard us, who will guard them? Who will guard the guardians? The Malin Guardian, if you really want to know.